Hello and welcome to Witch Please, a fortnightly podcast about the Harry Potter world. I'm Marcel Cosman. And I'm Hannah McGregor. And today, as we begin the final novel in the Harry Potter series, let's take a moment to talk about how far we've come on our journey making this podcast. In the sorting chat, rebooting this podcast has been an incredible journey. And Marcel, you're making it sound like we're dying. You didn't hear? Oh, I for- forgot about that pact that was signed. <laughs> it's our Harry Potter death pact. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but seriously, though, rebooting this podcast has been an incredible journey. And I'm feeling a little bit nostalgic, but I want to talk about the trials. I want to talk about the things that were hard. And I want you to start. <laughs> What a trap. This really does feel like <laughs> this feels like a trap. Like on the count of three, let's both say what we really think about each other. <gasps> you know, the hardest moment was <laughs> finishing any of the books. <laughs> That's the trial for me, you know, particularly in this reboot. Like in the original run, the trial was every time I edited an episode. Oh, because same. here's my... My deep, dark confession as somebody who, like, teaches podcasting and is always like, you can edit your own podcast. It's not that hard. Anybody can do it. I hate it. I hate it. Why did I agree to produce my own audiobook? I don't know, because I hate it. And the fact that somebody else does that now really has just taken, like, the primary trial and just defeated it. Just slayed thanks, that coach. dragon. Yeah, thanks, coach. Sorry, coach. Yeah, and so for me, it has become, ironically, reading the books. Not because I'm not enjoying it, because I'm actually, I'm finding the experience really rewarding, because when it's time to start a new book, we've just finished a bunch of really deep conversations about the previous one, and so I feel like I have all of these new insights to bring into the next one, so I'm actually getting a lot out of this reread, Mm -hmm. but I am a really slow reader. Hmm. Yeah, I read really slowly. And that has been a challenge throughout my many graduate degrees in literature. Oh, <laughs> where you are. I hear that. Frequently being tasked with reading enormous quantities of text. And I just assume that either everybody else is reading much faster than me, or secretly nobody else is doing the reading one or the other, or some combination thereof. But Mm -hmm. I want to actually, you know, read the thing, and I want to read it carefully and closely. And so I read slowly. And uh, it is a fun process, but it's also like like finding your way through a labyrinth. (laughs) It takes a while. Yeah, I'm also a very slow reader, and it has just been like... Also a real albatross around my neck throughout my grad degrees too, right? (laughs) Like I just always being the person who comes in and is straight up like at the beginning of the seminar, I didn't, I wasn't able to finish it. (laughs) I just need everyone to know I'm not pretending. Marcel, what has been your trial through this quest? Is it what a bitch I am? Uh, no, should it be? (laughs) (laughs) is that what you've been going for (laughs) yeah i'm being as mean as i can marcel (laughs) interesting uh no something that i had actually forgotten about until i started thinking about you know what i thought we should talk about in this segment is is when we first started the reboot i was having nonstop technical problems. Do you remember? Like every time we got together to record, either my Zoom would freeze Mm -hmm. or my recorder would just stop accepting battery power. And in hindsight, it probably only happened like three or four times. But because it was so consistent, it was very, very upsetting for me because it wasn't something that I could fix. It was just something that I had to 
experience. And I don't like that. The worst, the worst kind of trials. But that also makes me think of the way that like they're facing these huge larger than life trials. But often the hardest thing is cold or hungry yeah. or hungry and cold or grumpy or grumpy because hungry. Yeah. <laughs> like sometimes, you know, in the midst of of trying to do something bigger and more significant, like making a very important podcast about Harry Potter. Sometimes, you know, you're defied in your higher mission by tiny grains of metaphorical sand. I'm really, this is getting away from me. This allegory is getting away from me. You're doing great. There's no way to misinterpret a hero's journey. And I think that's really what we're going to get to in this episode. Let's get to it then. (laughs) Good students, like good adventurers, always make sure they've got everything they'll need for the journey ahead. Let's make sure we've packed the right notes for our adventure in revision. Okay, we opted to start our reboot by talking about Chosen One narratives and introducing listeners to the Western literary concept of the hero's journey, also known as as the monomyth. <laughs> Might as well call it a manomyth, am I right, ladies? Uh! <laughs> <laughs> That's right. In our very first reboot episode, we looked at the ideas of a couple of boring old white guys. Blah, 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 blah. We drew a Northrop Fry's boring definition of a hero, for example. And <laughs> wow, was it ever boring. Fry argues that the plot of literary fiction generally, quote, consists of somebody doing something, <laughs> end quote. <laughs> An incredible and iconic literary scholar. And that this person, the one doing something, is generally speaking the hero? Marcel, surely this is wrong. <laughs> Listen, I have written some grossly reductive notes here, but what you are reading is correct. Straight up quoted from Anatomy of Criticism, arguably the second most boring book in the world. What's the most boring book in the world? It's Jürgen Habermas's The Structural Transformation of the Public Sphere. I'll take your word for that. I've never read either of them. For Fry, and hence for our cis-heteronormative patriarchal white supremacist culture, the hero is the one who does the things in the literature. And Fry qualifies his heroes with this further boring term called the hero's power of action. According to Fry, the hero's power of action by which I think he just means abilities. This is do his doing somethingness. <laughs> the hero's power of action, by which I think he just means abilities, can be greater than the readers, less than the readers, or, and this is another quote, roughly the same as the readers. It must have been so easy to be a literary critic in the 70s. Oh, can you imagine? <laughs> and just be like, books, they have things in them. People do those things. And then people go like fucking bananas. And they're like, wow. Okay, so roughly the same as the readers. Yeah, and so, okay, so we've got these these three different relationalities, we can say, right? And so it's this relation of the hero's power of action to the reader's own power of action that determines what kind of fiction the story is. Okay. I have some issues with this, but it is coming back to me now. What? So I know, shocking. So (laughs) you argued way back in our very first episode, two years ago, that Harry Potter's power of action is the fourth type. Uh, Quote, superior neither to other men nor to his environment, meaning that the hero is one of us end quote, like an everyman figure. Mm, mm Mm-hmm, precisely. I did. I did make that claim. And I want to put a pin in that because we're going to talk about it more, but 
since the hero is the one doing the things in the literature, yes. we need to remember the boring old white guy term that we introduced for the doing of the things. Oh, okay. Thing doing. Was it thing doing? The thing doing. It, uh, it, was, uh, it was that, but also. And, yes, and. Yes, and. Both and. The term is the hero's journey. Oh, I remember that one. Yeah, 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 yeah. So in our first episode, we explained that the hero's journey, which is also called the monomyth, is a tool used to understand all kinds of stories, everything from quest narratives and ancient myths and children's sagas, and even personal experiences, like a lot of um, memoirs about addiction and recovery, for example, draw on the monomyth. We talked about this a bit in in our life writing episode as well, the way that sort of structures like the monomyth then inform the way that people tell their stories. Mm-hmm, that's right. So this term, the hero's journey, was coined by boring old white guy Joseph Campbell Ooh. in 1949. And the hero's journey consists of up to 17 sort of kind of ishy standard experiences that we, the audience, can apparently recognize. I mean, I want to hear about all 17 of these, but that's not what we're doing yet. Mm -mm. Summarizing. So, you know us. We hate letting boring old white guys go unchecked. So we also drew on works by Elise M. Wisniewski and Naaman Gobert Tallahan, who in their separate scholarship unpack the function of chosen one narratives in popular culture. So according to Wisniewski, quote, the chosen one embodies Anglo-American understandings of the hero, his fated destiny, and his journey, rooted in the literary architecture of medieval fantasy, which frequently understands the hero as a Christ figure. He sacrifices, dies, and is resurrected to save a community and its values, end quote. And for Tallahan, we noted this ending in which Harry saves the wizarding world and preserves its values is profoundly alienating for those of us who found ourselves hooked by a series that was ostensibly about the value of difference and our heroes longing to belong in a world where difference is celebrated. Oh, yeah. We can't not talk about this terrible epilogue, huh? Mm, we cannot. Okay. All right. I desperately want to get into the details of this. So let's move on to our next segment so we can start unpacking these ideas. After all that talk about boring old white guys and their boring old ideas, let's cross that threshold and go straight into transfiguration class. So one of the things that I've learned about myself over these years of making the reboot of Witch Please is that I typically way over prepare. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you often write a short novel. Indeed. So I'm doing something different this time. Okay, you're going to write a presentation on a book you haven't read. You're not wrong, Hannah. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and mm -hmm. for this transfiguration class, I am taking us way back to the content that we looked at for episode one. Because when, when we first introduced these ideas way, way back, looking at Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, we were working with a very different novel and with very different characters. True story. And now that we have substantially more content and indeed more context for this conversation, I want us to really get into the details of these archetypes so that we can think about how Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows conforms to, deviates from, and dare I say, plays with generic expectations. Oh my goodness, dare you? Dare I? I dare. So it sounds like you're merging transfiguration class and owls. I think we should. Oh my god, Marcel. I know. Not completely. We're still we're gonna we're gonna have owls. Don't worry. We need those sound effects, coach. Don't you worry. But I propose that we talk about the Deathly Hallows structurally in this segment. 
lining it up with our archetypes as much as possible. And then in owls, we can get into the details and complicate the archetypes with our <coughs> indefatigable resistant readings. I mean, they can't be fatigated. That's true. They shall never fatigue. And I've made us two charts. Two? Okay, what what chart are we going to start with? What's our okay, What's our start chart? Our start chart. We're going to start with Fry's modes of fiction. Oh, this North, guy that's again. Northrop Fry. I know he's so boring. So I have color coded the chart as like a grayscale rainbow. Hmm. We'll put them in the transcript. Okay, Marcel, tell me about this chart. Okay, so we have to remember that according to Fry, we categorize fiction based on the hero's power of action in relation to our own. And so Fry outlines five different potential types of action. So the hero's power of action, option one. Hero has abilities that are superior to the reader's and superior to the reader's environment. So this type of hero is divine. So this would be like a god or a goddess. Creation myths, yeah? Like would be in this, like, oh, you know, this person like went to the bottom of the ocean and found the seed of all life and then turned that like, ma- why am I making up a creation myth? Because I can't think of a single real one right now. But creation myths would be an example, Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, like, in general, this type of fiction would be myth, right? So, like, Greek and Roman gods and their shenanigans, this kind of thing. Okay, so option number two. Mm -hmm. Hero has heightened abilities, not superior, but heightened abilities that are otherwise similar to the reader's own, and ordinary laws of nature, that is the reader's environment, so so what we would as readers consider ordinary laws of nature, are suspended. So this type of hero is a prodigy, a human, but with marvelous abilities in a marvelous world. Okay, like superheroes, like Marvel movies would fall in this category. Yeah, we could also think of Aragorn, right? A marvelous human with marvelous abilities in a marvelous world. So unlike material girls living in a material world, he's a marvelous, he's a marvelous boy girl living, living in a marvelous, in a marvelous world. world. Okay. Yes. Marvel super Oh my gosh, Hannah. Marvel. Yeah, I'm very smart. You're so <laughs> smart. So this type of fiction would be romances, not like romance novels, romances like um King Arthur. Yes, exactly. Legends. Another marvelous boy living in a marvelous world. Indeed. Okay. Option number three. Hero has heightened abilities that are otherwise similar to the reader's own. So that's similar to the previous one, right? But the hero is subject to social criticism and the order of nature as the reader would understand it. So this type of hero is called a leader, So this is a human with exceptional abilities, but in a mundane world. Mm, Okay. So, I mean, (laughs) I don't know. I'm still thinking about Marvel. (laughs) (laughs) Mm -hmm. This is the sort of more recent trend of like superhero movies that are like, but what about the real stakes? But what about what, how, how this actually impacts people's lives. Hmm. I like that. Yes, yes, definitely. So Fry says that this type of fiction tends to be epic or tragedy. And so I think this makes sense, right? Like if we're thinking about the epic, which is just like so long and you got to go into so many details and look at all the things that happen. I, yeah, I don't feel like that's related. I think you just gave away how little you like epics. <laughs> but like the Iliad or the Odyssey. Sure. Neither of which I've ever read. Oh, I read them both. Um, And they're just guys, um, but they're like really good at fighting or really good at outsmarting Cyclops. Okay. Okay. Um, And also tragedies. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Like Oedipus Rex, who's really good at fucking his mom. Gross. Cool. Another one I haven't read, but yes. Okay. What next? Option number four. 
hero's abilities are equivalent to the reader's and, as such, subject to the order of nature as the reader understands it. This is the everyman. Exactly. Yeah. And so we identify with this hero because they are one of us. And so this type of fiction is often comedy and what Fry calls realistic fiction. So that comedy tragedy distinction is probably like in part a Shakespearean distinction. Like in the tragedies, the heroes are often larger than life leader figures, whereas in the comedies, they're more likely to be like just a guy. Yeah. And so like what they set out to do in the tragedies is like beyond the abilities of the mundane world, you know, and so they fail. Yeah. Whereas in the comedies, they're just trying to like get married. Yeah. Or get laid. Or both. Okay. So there's one more. There's one more. Um, The final one, option number five, the hero's abilities are inferior to the reader's and the hero is therefore frustrated by the order of nature. So like Fry doesn't give an example of this in the small portion that I was willing to reread for this recording. But I think we can think of clowns. So not fools, les clowns, not fools, because like Shakespearean fools tend to be wise. Yeah, exactly. But like clown as in, like, if we think about waiting for Godot. The immediate story that I thought of is don't let the pigeon drive the bus. Oh, that's so cute. Yes. For folks who don't know, it's the first in what ended up being a longer series of children's books in which the protagonist is a pigeon uh, who should not be allowed to do things because the pigeon is not good at those things. And the pigeon the pigeon is going to throughout the book constantly try to convince you to let them drive the bus, but you shouldn't let the pigeon drive the bus. No, because pigeons can't drive buses. But that's a real, like, the part of what's fun about that is that the pigeon is this sort of clown figure who, like can't do things and shouldn't be allowed to do things. Totally. And I think in children's literature like that, it provides opportunities for children who are reading the books with like an older loved one to identify together as knowing better than the pigeon, right? So the kid can be like, pigeons can't drive the bus. That's silly. And that's nice. And for adult fiction, not like XXX fiction, but like fiction for grown-ups, we would think of irony and absurdity as being the sort of like main types of fiction that we'd be looking at here. I mean, I think absurdity is also one of the major kinds of children's fiction. Because kids love to notice when things are silly. Okay, so based on this beautiful chart, the model of fiction is determined by the hero's power of action. And so Harry's growth and transformation as our hero of this series shapes the genre of the series as a whole. Okay. And so in our first episode, we talked about how Harry is supposed to function as an everyman. We problematized the idea of the everyman. But the whole point is like he's coming into this world with no more knowledge of it than we have and no more magical ability than we have starting out, which is why as a reader you're able to imagine yourself into the position of Harry and also participate in the fantasy of like finding out that you're actually a wizard. Exactly, because the important thing is that he's awkward and lonely, just like those of us who read the book and were like, oh my God. Also me, I also sleep in a cupboard of feelings. Cupboard of feelings, exactly. So we start the series by strongly identifying with our hero, even though he embodies all kinds of privileges that most of us readers, especially most of us readers who identify with him so strongly, don't. But that changes through the series, doesn't it? It sure does. Yeah. And I think that by the time we get to book seven, Harry, obviously not an everyman anymore. No. I think think we're dealing with a prodigy. Prodigy and leader are still a bit muddy for me. So can you explain why you think prodigy rather than leader? Prodigy is the one that's like heightened abilities and the ordinary laws of nature are suspended. And leader is the one that's like heightened abilities, but the laws of nature endure 
So I think that if we went back in time to when we were talking about book five, I think that we could make a pretty sound argument for Harry being a leader, like fitting into the category of leader as hero in book five. Like when he starts Dumbledore's army. Precisely. And I think that that has to do with the fact that like Umbridge's presence and the number of rules and regulations, they suspend the magical world in a way Mm. that changes Harry's ability to be heroic. Oh, interesting. Interesting. So it's like his heroism in that context has less to do with pulling off incredible magical feats and more to do with his like willingness to fight against authority and help organize people. Exactly. So he's more of, he's being a leader. Exactly. And so I think that maybe in order to understand what constitutes Harry's journey in book seven, we need to talk a little bit more about his power of action, because I think that is what will allow us to think about him as a prodigy and not... A leader. Hang on, though. You said that Fry says that the hero's abilities determine the type of fiction. Are you suggesting now that the type of fiction might determine the hero's abilities? I think that's a splendid way of putting it, Hannah. I mean, which comes first? Does the hero fit the genre or does the genre fit the hero? Which white guy is correct is what (laughs) I want to know. Yeah, so it's possible that Harry's abilities change as the kind of story being told changes rather than the story. So, like, Harry gets Christ-like abilities in this book Mm -hmm. because this book wants to create a Christ narrative more than the book is organized around the sort of inevitability of, of Harry's powers becoming... Those of sacrifice and rebirth. I think one could certainly say, yeah, yeah. That would make him a prodigy in this final book. Yes. Okay. I I would like to, I would like to explore why. Okay. All right. Tell me more. So this is where we're going to move on to the second chart, which is Joseph Campbell's boring monomyth chart. Great. Right? Also lots of good colors here, though. Thank you. Thank you. So it's important to note that unlike Fry's boring modes of fiction, Campbell's boring monomyth actually like like caught on. It like yeah. struck a chord with both consumers and creators of popular culture. And so it's actually been reproduced and rearticulated many times over. And there are lots of different variations to choose from. So when I first like started to put together the notes for this episode, I thought that it would make sense to use the 17 stages as outlined in Campbell's own boring ass words. But again, because people have read them and developed them and improved them, I think it actually just doesn't make sense to look at his 1949 explanation of what a he- what a hero's journey looks like. <laughs> okay, so you're, we're not going to be directly quoting from Campbell. We're going to just be sort of taking his structure and and using your own words to explain the stages. It's a combination of my own words and then some of some breakdowns of the hero's journey that uh, I found from two different university library websites. Thanks, university librarians. All right, so Campbell's monomyth has three stages, okay? And each of those stages has various steps, we might say. So the first stage, we're calling departure. The second stage, we're calling trials and victories of initiation. And then the third and final stage is the return. Gotcha. And this is the sort of monomyth as the like there and back again, like hero goes off, transforms, and then comes back home. Yeah. It's often depicted in a circle and departure and return are both depicted on the top of the circle, okay? Because you're doing a journey where you cross the threshold and go into the underworld and then you return, Mm. okay? 
So the whole trials and tribulations part is all below threshold. Like if you imagined a line bisecting the circle horizontally, like you're starting at the top and then when you cross under, you're you're down into the trials and then you pass through the underworld and then when you come back out, you're in the return. Exactly. Yeah. And so so departure and return are also about like, we can also think of them as being both like one quarter of the story each. And then the trials is half the story. Okay. So we begin in the departure zone. Mm. Okay. We begin in the hero's ordinary world. Okay. So when we were reading Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, the ordinary world is our world, right? Yes. But when we're reading Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows, the ordinary world is not the muggle world anymore it's it's the burrow it's the burrow yeah it's the the it's the wizarding world that harry now feels part of and all of the sort of normal things like going getting on the hogwarts express and go, right cuz they're sort of you know feeling nostalgic about these things they don't get to do totally now. yeah yeah like leaving privet drive is not the crossing of a threshold for harry anymore yeah because it's what he does every summer he goes to the burrow that's his regular world. But this ordinary world is missing something. Okay. So the idea here is it's the ordinary, it's Harry's ordinary world, but it's not as it should be. Okay? There's something wrong. There's something wrong that prompts the hero to journey. Precisely. So typically, uh, part next step is the call to adventure. Um, and the important thing that I think we just want to draw attention to here is the fact that um, the purpose of the adventure is to restore or preserve the values of the community. Gotcha. Gotcha. So we got we to gotta get rid of Voldemort to restore the wizarding world to the way it's supposed to be. Exactly. So things get a little bit weird when there's like the refusal of the call. I'm not, I would argue that Harry's, so where like classically the refusal of the call is like, but I can't be a wizard, that kind of thing. But I think here, what might be more accurate is Harry's refusal of help. He keeps yeah. trying to refuse help, right? So there's like the seven Harrys at the beginning and he's like, no, we're not doing that. Absolutely not. He doesn't want Ron and Hermione to come with them. He doesn't want, yeah. And then the last important step of this, of, of this, uh, this quarter of the journey is the, um, the arrival of the supernatural aid or the meeting with the mentor, okay? And I think here, this is the scene when Scrimger arrives and gives them their gifts. Yeah. Dumbledore's three bequeathments. supernatural things that are going to end up aiding them in their quest. Exactly. Including the fourth thing that Scrimger won't give them, which is the sword of Godric Gryffindor, which we'll put a pin in. So now we're now we're about to cross the threshold, okay? We're going into the underworld. Here we go, and the underworld is a tent. <laughs> well, not, not yet. yet. I guess it's 12 Grimmauld Place to start. <laughs> no, not yet. No! Oh, my God. <laughs> no, not What's yet. So, oh, what is it, Marcel? I think it's the Muggle world. Oh. I think it's... So they leave the safety and the security of the burrow because it's no longer safe and secure. They disapparate immediately. And all of a sudden, they're in the muggle world. They're not going to Hogwarts. They don't know where they're going. They will eventually go to number 12 Grimmel Place, but that is in the next step. Okay. Oh, my God. So they go into this unknown world, and the unknown, unfamiliar world compared to the wizarding world is a shitty coffee shop where the cappuccinos taste like sludge. And like flickering lights. So grim. And two strange fucking men. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. All right. It's dark. The muggle world is dark. That's so interesting. Okay. It is. Yeah. So the next step is actually a series of steps that, we, that we're just going to collapse all into one. Okay. And we're going to call it tests, allies, and enemies. Okay. This is really the protein of the trials and victories shake. Okay. <laughs> so... <laughs> Gotcha, because they're going through a series of, of tests. So this is like them figuring out how to get to 12 Grimmauld Place and 
and dealing with the like creepy spells that have been and it's them befriending creature and it's them hunting down mundungus and it's them getting the locket and it's them like so it's all of these sort of fits and starts as they as they start figuring stuff out so this this i took from one of the uh from one of the library websites there is often a local watering hole component which i really enjoy and I think that this is what we can think of as number 12 Grimmel Place. It's like where they regroup. It's their sort of safe space. They're in the quest portion, the underworld portion, but they still have kind of this home. Mm-hmm. Even, and you know, the tent kind of pr- functions like that too a little bit. It's like, okay, we've still got a safe place to be as we go out on these little mini adventures and start figuring shit out. That's right. And then shit goes even wronger (laughs) right things get even harder that could be the title of every chapter in this book (laughs) shit goes even wronger and this is where it says the true characteristics of the hero are revealed and i think we can sort of expand on that to think of this is also where like allies start to chip away right so Mm, ron leaving yeah the presence of the locket is so poisonous That it eventually compels Ron to leave. Yeah. And so now our heroes are heading into the next step, which is the, it's the place where the object of the quest is hidden. So we don't know what it is yet. Mm -hmm. We just know that they got to go to Godric's Hollow. Okay. Harry keeps saying that he thinks that they need to go there. Hermione's trying to forestall it, but eventually is like, okay, I can't think of anywhere else we can go. They go there. The thing that they want is not only not there, (laughs) but then a snake comes out of a human woman's mouth. (laughs) That scene is so scary. And this is so, so interesting because you you have pointed out on the chart here that while you call this stage the approach to the innermost cave, it's often also called the land of the dead which is such an interesting way to think of Godric's Hollow because they literally spend most of their time there in a cemetery, like, considering the dead and, like, encountering the dead and don't even realize that, like, they're encountering this woman who they think is going to help us, but, like, oh, psych, she's also the dead. She's dead! Yeah. She's totally dead! Exactly. So... We leave that step and we move on to, if you can believe it, that's not the supreme ordeal. <laughs> there no, is that's yet the approach another. to the innermost cave. Now <laughs> exactly. it's time for the supreme ordeal. <laughs> and so this is where the hero experiences a kind of life or death moment. And I think that this is the frozen lake. Okay. Harry's wand is broken. Yep. He's borrowing Hermione's wand. We know that it's not going to work as well for him. That's just how it works. For some reason, he decides to follow a mysterious doe wandering in the woods in the middle of English winter. Because he knows what kind of story he's in. Exactly. So Harry goes to the frozen lake and in his attempt to get what he sees, which is the treasure, the object of the quest, the sword of Gryffindor, the locket almost kills him. And it is only when he is rescued by friendship that he survives. I mean, this is so interesting because in the in the traditional hero's journey, you know, that scene is so reminiscent of like the lady in the lake and the sword and the stone, you know. And so it should in the traditional hero's journey, it should be Harry who gets the sword. But it isn't. But we're not going to talk about that in this segment. What's the next one? So the library website says, after surviving, our hero takes possession of the object, typically a treasure, weapon, knowledge, token, or reconciliation. And so I'm like, okay, literally all of the above. Incredible. All of the above. Great. Ron's back. We can now cross the threshold again. Okay. Okay. So we're skipping a bunch of shit because we're just looking at the chart. We're crossing the threshold. We're going back to the known world. Can you guess where that is? They have to go back to Hogwarts. They go back to Hogwarts. Of course. (laughs) They obviously had to go back to Hogwarts. Yeah. I got goosebumps, Marcel. Can you imagine if book seven didn't have Hogwarts in it? It It would feel wrong. It would. It would because Hogwarts is part of the known world at this 
point. It's the center of the known world as far as the series progresses. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So, okay. So they go back to Hogwarts. So now we're on step 11. Okay. So we're in the return. We've done the threshold crossing. Now there's another final test. Okay. So this is step number 11. It's called resurrection. I was about to say, any chance it's named after one of the objects that Harry has to find? (laughs) Step 11 is called, I open at the close. I didn't even put that together. I was just like, what do you mean? What do you mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Remember that stone? Remember that resurrection stone? That's right. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Okay. So, miraculous transformation, purification, and rebirth of the hero. This is where we're at. This is where the true hero chooses to sacrifice themselves for the people that they love, right? And Voldemort is like, cool. You dead. And Harry's like, okay. I guess I dead. I guess I dead. Joke's on you. Harry doesn't die, as we know, because we're in step number 12, which is the return. This is when our triumphant hero returns with something called the elixir. Okay? Oh. Elixir doesn't need to be a liquid, doesn't need to be Felix Felicis. It can be treasure, love, freedom, wisdom, knowledge, etc. Okay? Or like a super powerful wand, maybe? Exactly. So Harry, because he is a good hero and learns his lessons, Mm -hmm. knows that the object is not to claim the wand. The object is to destroy the wand so that nobody can do this ever again. Yes. Because he has, by virtue of Going into the underworld and encountering his dead, which he actually does multiple times in this book, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. he has come face to face with death, does not fear it, and so no longer attempts to, like, outsmart death through the Deathly Hallows. That's right. Yeah. Voldemort never learns that lesson. No, he does not. No. He still thinks that the treasure is the thing. Right? That the treasure is the object. And that's why he and his hero's journey is a tragedy. Yeah. (laughs) He loses. Harry wins. And then Harry snaps the wand in half like Lindsay Lohan at the end (laughs) of Mean Girls, breaking the tiara. And throwing little pieces of it out to everybody. (laughs) Neville, you get a piece. Luna, you get a piece. (laughs) (laughs) and that's it marcel i am sure that you could feel me like desperately wanting to get into the details of how this plays out in this book so can we do that please let's do it let's go to owls say marcel if this reboot is a journey and we're the heroes, does that mean the season is the beginning of our return home? Mm. Let's map our thoughts onto these structures and see where they overlap in owls. All right, Hannah. Yesterday, you texted me some thoughts about the narrative structure of this book and how interesting it is in relation to how quest narratives are supposed to work. I did because I'm very fun and a great friend. Yeah. And so I would love it if you could talk here about what you mean by that. Yes, absolutely. So what really struck me in this read through is the strange narrative pacing of this book. And I think that there's a kind of easy explanation of its strange narrative pacing and then say a more interesting one. So they are on a quest And so you would anticipate that quest being like a series of steps in the direction of or away from, you know, like strides and setbacks. But what this book contains are weeks and weeks, even months at a time of total stasis. That's right. Just these long stretches of time where they're just like in number 12 Grimmauld Place. They have no idea what they're supposed to be doing. They have no leads. They have no plans. And they can't go anywhere because 
they're not sure how the Death Eaters knew where they were when they first disapparated from the wedding. Mm -hmm. And then finally, through no particular action of their own, they're kind of handed a lead. And they're like, oh, a lead. Oh, my God. Thank God. (laughs) And then, you know, they have their one little adventure, right? They go to the ministry. They get the locket. They have to shift to the tent because number 12 Grimmel Place has been compromised. And then they are just in that fucking tent for months. Again, just nothing. They have no leads. They have no plans. They have no ideas. And now they don't have a creature to cook for them. And now they don't have a creature to cook for them. And so obviously Ron starts bullying Hermione because she's not good enough at cooking. I will drown him in a frozen pond. Mm-mm-mm. But again, like not, there's just nothing, ha- you know, and then they get another little lead, right? They go to Godric's Hollow and something happens or they, but like the next big step is the doe shows up, which is just Snape being like, you're obviously not going to solve this problem yourself. So here's a sword in a lake. Enjoy. I guess I have to do everything. They are constantly in a state of stasis. And so when you think about, like, the hero's journey being defined by the hero's action, Mm -hmm. Harry is almost incapable of action through the majority of this book. Yeah, he sure is. Yeah. So the easy explanation for this, and the one that, like, certainly, you know, when I have mentioned noticing this to people, their explanation is the book wasn't edited well enough. (laughs) Mm -hmm. At this point, Rowling is so famous that editors are just like, whatever you do. She's allowed to just do whatever she wants. This book is so highly anticipated. Um, It's very frequent that like later books in incredibly popular series become quite bad because nobody's editing that person anymore because they're too famous. Or maybe the book was, you know, under pressure to come out at a certain time. And so she was like, that's, I think, sort of the low hanging fruit. Sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But. I think in the context of thinking about this book as a chosen one narrative, whether or not we think it's well done, Mm -hmm. it is now such a canonical and culture shaping example of a hero's journey that we have to think seriously about what it does to the concept of the hero's journey. Mm -hmm. And, And what it does is introduce this like, in action, this stasis, this this failure to be able to move as being a structural part of the journey throughout. Like, imagine if in The Lord of the Rings, at one point, like, Frodo and Sam just, like, didn't know where Mordor was and had to hang out in a tent for a month and just squabble about where they thought Mordor might be. Until Gollum comes along. Until Gollum comes along and is like, it's there. It's right there. I'll take you, precious. Yeah. So from the beginning to the end, if we just look at the beginning and the end of this book, Harry is absolutely that chosen one, Christ-like, King Arthur, Luke Skywalker, hero figure, right? Gotta do the damn thing. He's special. He's chosen. He has to find a magic sword that he claims in a lake, and then he has to go and use that sword to defeat the bad guy, and he's got to sacrifice himself. And by dying and returning, he cleanses the world and returns it to its proper order. Sure. Yes, absolutely. But in between that, Harry is constantly furious about the fact that he has no idea what's going on. Nobody gave him any information. He is explicitly worried that Ron and Hermione are going to figure out that That he he doesn't know what's going on. And that big fight that he has with Ron is Ron losing faith with the idea of Harry as the kind of hero that everybody thinks Harry is. It's the moment when Ron realizes that being the chosen one means nothing. You know what's really interesting about that, too, is that 
in that role, Ron is the reader's proxy being like, I thought this was going to be an adventure. It's not a fucking adventure. You're just in a tent. You don't know what you're doing. I thought you would have it figured out by now. And what's really interesting is then, so then Ron goes away. And when Ron comes back, he sort of steps into the role of the hero in that moment, right? Like he he himself crosses magically over this threshold. He brings himself back to his friends. He follows the same doe that Harry follows. He claims the sword. He saves Harry. He destroys the locket. And when Harry describes what Ron has just done, Ron is like, well, it wasn't that glamorous when it was happening. You just made it sound cool when you described it like that. And Harry's like, I've been trying to tell you that this whole time. That actually there's nothing glamorous or romantic about any of this. It all fucking sucks. Okay, so the fact that all three of them get these bequeathments from Dumbledore, on the one hand, suggests that all three of them are on their hero journeys, on their heroic journeys, on their hero's journey, singular, anyway. They're all heroes and they're all journeying. And their journeys don't quite overlap. They don't overlap. Oh my God, that line when Ron's like, Dumbledore must have known that I was going to leave. And Harry's like, no, he knew that you would always want to come back. Just got chills. Okay. So the three of them, like the Deathly Hallows, that trifecta, they need to work together. So they are on their individual hero journeys, but they're together. And when they're together is when they're at their strongest. Yeah, 100%. And so there is this, there's this really, I think, kind of, interesting possibility of how we read this book in particular. Yes, Harry goes through all of the gestures of this hero, but he is going through them with a kind of like self-aware distance from them. He knows he's not the hero people think he is. Mm -hmm. He knows he's not on the kind of quest that everybody assumes he is. He hates it. He's anxious about it. He's angry about it. He wishes that he lived in a world where Dumbledore was more of a Gandalf type who was just like an angel on earth full of wisdom and goodness, (laughs) right? Ready to return on a cool horse right when he needs them. But like, look to the east. Dumbledore's not Gandalf. Dumbledore's a dude who like fucked up a lot. Mm -hmm. And Harry is not Frodo or Aragorn or any of this. Like, he's just a kid who, like, doesn't know how to cook and is very hungry and, like, really misses being at school (laughs) where, like, somebody's making his fucking bed for him. And, like, none of them are, right? Like, none of them are the the plucky heroes that they they know that they ought to be. Mm -hmm. And so the reason why Harry has to do the the quintessential hero's journey shit at the end is because Voldemort set that up. That's right. Yes. Yeah. It's that Voldemort has so fully internalized this notion of like how he will, what it means for Harry to be the chosen one, the fact that he has to be killed, the fact that Mm -hmm. Voldemort needs to claim the elder one, right? Voldemort is operating within these like really normative myths of how power operates. And so like, you know, why does Harry have to die so that Voldemort can die? Harry has to die because he became a Horcrux because Voldemort overinvested in a uh, prophecy. That's right. You know, the Elder Wand matters because Voldemort has decided the Elder Wand matters. Like, when we take a step back, we can see this whole journey as, like, them going through the motions of a hero's quest because other people have decided that that is how this story needs to unfold. Mm -hmm. And within the actual experience of it, they're just frustrated, bored, hungry, angry, lonely, confused, so cold. So cold. And it really does drive home that, like, it's just not that glamorous. Being a hero kind of really fucking sucks. Mm -hmm. None of them want to do it. 
and they would actually just really prefer to not. They would just prefer to go to school. They just want to be students. They would just prefer to go to school. You know, they just want to, like, hang out at the side of a lake and, like, make out and gossip because they're teenagers. (laughs) Same. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, you are also a teenager. That's true about you. In Transfiguration class, I made the claim that I think Harry is a prodigy, right? He's not an everyman anymore. He's not a leader because the magical world is marvelous. And his abilities are marvelous because he has learned so much, right? And I think all of these things remain true even in this experience of the hero's journey as just being frustrated over and over again. That it's like there's still these remnants of these characters as everyman characters, even though they're prodigies. And so so the adventure can't be a prodigious journey, it still has to be a frustrating and a cold and a hungry and a listless and a directionless journey. They're prodigies, but just barely. Like, they just barely escape Voldemort time after time after time, mm-hmm. you know, and they get hurt and they lose things along the way. Like, they're, you know, their capacity to be a prodigy is sort of there for anyone who chooses to seize it, which is the other interesting thing, because the sword of Gryffindor is not just Harry's. Dumbledore leaves it to him in his will, but that is actually as insignificant as, you know, Scrimgeour says it is when he's like, you can't just have this sword. <laughs> he's he's actually right. Harry yeah. can't just have the sword. You know, so he goes to claim the sword, but actually Ron gets it. And later on, Neville gets the sword. Like, actually, the sword is just for whoever is going to be a hero right that moment. That's right. But yeah, there's this constant... I mean, you said at the beginning that we just love our indefatigable, resistant readings. So I am excited by the way that this book constantly undermines its own hero's journey. Mm Mm-hmm that it's constantly destabilizing the notion of the hero, and that even though it has what I think we can agree is a pretty deeply dissatisfying ending. Oh, yeah. Because it does sort of return us to those community values. It does have this image of, like, everything is fine because we're all back to going to Hogwarts. Mm -hmm. We're back at Platform 9 and 3 quarters, and everybody has successfully reproduced themselves heterosexually such that the future is intact Mm -hmm. because everybody all of the good all of the good straights had their good children and (laughs) made a a new generation that will look exactly the same like all of that incredibly ticky tacky little burrows yes yes on a hillside all of that really sort of dissatisfyingly conservative trend of this kind of hero's journey is in place Mm -hmm. but within the actual like that's only when you look at it really really far away um when you actually get into the details of it there is this throughout the sort of undermining of the very notion of heroism Mm -hmm. as any kind of specialness right the idea that any person is more special than any other. You know, I'm just thinking about this now because like we do talk about how unsatisfying the ending is and how nothing changes. And if the lesson is that heroism isn't really real, nobody is special enough to change it, we should listen to the lesson of the book, which is that these kids don't have the ability to revolutionize the wizarding world because it's not because the hero's journey isn't a revolutionary journey it's a, it's a conservative journey it's about conserving the status quo yeah i mean that's interesting because these kids are not revolutionaries the example of the revolutionary that we get is voldemort yeah and in this sense it is quite a conventionally liberal story insofar as it casts revolution as villainy. And I think we're maybe going to do an episode later on 
on this book or maybe in our appendix series about what you referred to as villains as being repositories of all of the qualities that we like to vilify, I guess. Yeah, yeah. The socially acceptable repository for... (laughs) For hatred. (laughs) For hatred. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it's really, it's not uncommon, like, if you'll forgive me for referencing Marvel movies this many times, like, the villains are always the ones who are like, but the environment. (laughs) There's just like some fucking like, like evil villain being like, people are starving. The way we live is fundamentally non-sustainable. And like, you know, killing half of the Earth's population is a very bad solution to that. Mm -hmm. But the heroes don't offer another solution. They're like, no, no, the way things are is fine. Mm -hmm. Right? So there is this, this impulse to say that like, maintenance of the status quo is what the good guys do. Revolution is what the bad guys do. And that's because these maps of narrative that we have been talking about are not neutral observations of the way that story works. They are ideological constructs that are attempting to further a particular version of the world. And that version of the world is an inherently conservative one that is organized around the idea of maintaining a set of values that keep a certain set of people in power. Hannah, are you suggesting that the old white dudes who developed these theories were attempting to structurally normalize white supremacist heteropatriarchal values? Yeah, yep, 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 yep. That's exactly what I'm suggesting. Oh my gosh, who knew literature was so powerful? <laughs> <laughs> right? So I don't think we can look at this book and be like, yep, it's radical. It's not. Yeah, it's not. No, no, no. It is conservative in the same way the hero's myth is conservative. And you're right. Like, these kids could never radicalize or revolutionize because... The possibility of revolution is a threat to the status quo, not a promise. And we can imagine revolutionary versions of this narrative. Like the one for me is like, wait, so hating muggles, staying separate from muggles, dividing the world into like squibs and real wizards, obsessing over like pure blood and like who has the capacity for magic. Those are all bad things. So therefore, wouldn't that mean that the good outcome would be like, we stop segregating the world into wizards and muggles? But that's, it can't, like the series can't imagine that because I think in large part, because as you pointed out, because of the way that the muggle versus wizarding worlds are structured as being this crossing of thresholds. Mm-hmm. And so we can't, like, the point of the hero's journey is not to ultimately destroy the threshold between (laughs) our world and the underworld (laughs) and just create chaos. It's to, like, restore the structure. And in the wizarding world, that structure is that muggles are over here in a world that is boring and bad, and wizards are over here in a world that is good and fun. Mm -hmm. And that division which is a fundamentally conservative division, has to be restored because otherwise there's no fantasy of escape. There's no fantasy of border crossing into a better place. Oh, beautifully said, Hannah. My goodness. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thanks. Anyway, I I think it's fun to think about the ways that this book both wants to be a hero's journey and doesn't want to be a hero's journey. You know, the way that it is still participating in and perpetuating those ideologies of the restoration of the status quo while at the same time being really suspicious of notions of heroism. And I think, again, in that suspicion of notions of heroism and that desire to notice that, like, Harry's not actually more special than his friends, there is, again, this kind of, like, little spark, this little spark of possibility that is what keeps bringing us back Mm -hmm. to these stories. The possibility of revolution. I gotta say, 
this has me so much more excited for this season than I already thought I was. I love the idea of setting the stage for this final novel with thinking about it as something that is inherently conservative, but that doesn't want to be conservative, but that kind of can't help itself. And so that's why we come along. <laughs> to, to, to blow on those little embers of radical ideas. Great fully work, Marissa. I love it. <laughs> ay, ay, ay. Thank you, witches, for joining us for another episode of Witch Please. Witch Please is produced in partnership with Wilfrid Laurier University Press and distributed by ACAST. You can find the rest of our episodes at ohwitchplease.ca. Special thanks, as always, to our team player of a producer, Hannah Rehack, a.k.a. Coach. Thanks, Coach. If you want to hang out with us some more, we're on Twitter and Instagram at Oh Witch Please with a ton of hot new content thanks to our Witch Please apprentice, the one and only Zoe Mix. Thanks, Zoe! And thank you to everyone who supports us on Patreon. We have like so many fun perks over there. I really need you to understand the degree to which you are missing out on content if you are not <laughs> on Patreon. We've got unedited bonus episodes, the most recent one being a two-hour increasingly drunk rambling conversation between me and Andrea Hazenbeck in which we get audibly margarita drunk as the episode proceeds. We've got comics about those blooper reels. We've got Marcel naming your appliances. Honestly, it is a magical world and you should come hang out with us at patreon.com slash oh witch please. It's true. Unlike the wizarding world, it's not transphobic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's one of the best things about our patrons <laughs> that we do actively love trans people. If you're not able to contribute financially, but you still want to lend us a hand, we would absolutely love it if you dropped us a review on Apple Podcasts. At the end of every episode, we'll shout out everyone who left us a five-star review. So you've got to review us if you want to hear me attempt to sing one of Elliot's new favorite songs. I've got records in my head everywhere that I go. No, that's not it. I've got records in my head spinning out I can Nope, that's not it either. They go round and around and again, round and around and again, round and around. Oh yeah, records in my head. Something like that. I don't know this song. I don't know it. It's the latest Weezer. Oh my god, new Weezer. Anyway, <laughs> it is a solid banger. This week, we are saying thank you to Thais... Arania, yes you may. Schleehead, good natured mischief, and Lindsay Hamilton. Thank you all so much. We'll be back next episode to continue our discussion of Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows. But until then, later witches. <laughs>